But the implication is that if we, as the reader, were also able to do this, we ourselves would be able to enter this book. So I could see people like getting super into this idea of like, we just got to believe enough to enter Fantastica. You didn't believe enough, apparently. Nothing else happened from Did here on Did you enter Fantastica? I gotta, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's what's considered an eighth wall break. <laughs> Welcome, friends, to episode 191 of the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm Luke. And I'm James. And this week we discuss Mikhail Inda's 1979 novel, The Neverending Story. All right, James, here we are. You, you promised it last week. Go ahead and regale our listeners with a rendition of the song. Never ending story. <laughs> <laughs> Just that alone, I think, is worth it. I can't. I actually don't remember the like tune of it. I'm, I'm gonna be excited to to uh, watch the movie and and have that. Oh, you'll remember it reminder. once we watch it. It'll be lodged in there, real, real nice, deep. Perfect. Like my only memory of it right now is coming from Stranger Things, who references it. Yeah. Which like. Wait, you're saying perfect. your only memory of any of this story, or just the song? No, no, just the song. Like I remember some of the movie, but like the music for whatever reason wasn't something that like lasted in my brain. Okay. Uh, I'm sure it'll it'll cut it'll be unlocked when we watch it, and I'll be like, oh yeah. But yeah, we I'd never read this book before. First time. How about you? Oh, never read the book before. Yeah, yeah. and honestly, I think this is one of those projects. Before we made a podcast, I wouldn't have even known that it was based on a book, even though it, it clearly seems like it should be. You know, it like feels yeah. like a story that's so book centric. It kind of does. It also, I just I don't know about you, but like I kept thinking of the Princess Bride. During Me this. too. Yeah, totally. I was gonna make There's that. There's so many comparison. similarities and like the the meta framing narratives and and you know what it's talking about with like storytelling and all this stuff. Um, and and we love that book and we had this you know awesome time covering it. So if you're interested in, in more of the same kind of stuff, check out those episodes. Um, but you know this is also very different than that than that story. I was kind of expecting the framing device to be something that was created by the filmmakers. And the story itself to just be what was contained within the book. But that is not the case at all. Um, and in fact, it's it's the book goes even farther with the framing than the movie. And to my memory, at least, it yeah. even touches on. I actually don't remember the movie that well. Like uh, yeah, going either. through, I was trying to. I, I'm pretty sure it's it, this is the book. The movie's fairly faithful to what we just read. I would assume for the most part, for up to a certain point. Um, but yeah, I mean. I, I re- for whatever reason i remember the movie being very very like new york it felt very like in a big city and this was felt like more i don't know he was he was at like some sort of like english school or something it felt more european yeah, to me more europe i mean he's european so that makes sense he's german yeah. um i think he was living in rome at the time um but I, I mean that could be the case i he was not happy with the film which we we could talk about a little bit here he even tried to a uh, sue the production to get it stopped when he found out how many changes they were going to make to it um, and he was unsuccessful obviously we got the movie made um, but yeah uh, Mikhail Inda not a huge fan of this of this film which has gone on to have a cult following and yeah. be sort of this classic that a lot of people look back on fondly and I have like a uh, analysis on this at this point I feel like this story is one that was made to be nostalgic for people who read these sort of like on the tracks on a quest you know what i mean very like one path to the journey is the journey and you have to do this thing and retrieve this thing and get this i think those sort of like really simple fantasy stories i think this was almost framed as like a nostalgia device for people who read those growing up and i don't know this is like a very mature novel necessarily but it doesn't feel like the same thing because of the metatextual nature of it and then it's interesting for me to think about it in terms of like being nostalgic for the film that was made in the 80s when it was when it was already sort of being like nostalgic for something even before that maybe yeah i mean there's some interesting layers there right because the movie is is tapping into that uh old kind of classic fantasy um i can see inspirations from fantasy that came before this but i mean this is an old novel 1979 so um it's also itself i think very influential 
Uh, I kept thinking about how it may have it may have affected other things. I mean, it may have affected Princess Bride. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. You know, things that it brings up for me too is something that was really big for me and still is to this day is video games and the way that like the linear storytelling path that some games will take. You know, your sandbox games and everything, but you have those stories that are really on rails and you're you're experiencing a journey. And it feels like, you know, go here, defeat this boss, retrieve this item, and then it'll, it'll allow you to go here. And it kind of it kind of could be the early, you know, early storytelling formats for, for a lot of like video games. Yeah. Well, I want to correct myself. Uh, I just looked it up. The Princess Bride came out in 1973, the book, originally, which we know we reread some later editions where he like added to it. Um, so he could it could not have been <laughs> an influence of that. Um, so we got to give William Goldman his due. But yeah, I like that point about video games. There is a sort of interactive nature, you know, and this is this predates video games, really. So it's like the idea of this, like getting into the story and affecting things. And I don't want to get into any spoilers here. I know we've kind of touched on some meta stuff and, and that might be spoiler adjacent, but um, we won't give specifics. Uh, I also have some interesting stuff about uh, Mikkel, which, which first off, I am apologies if I mispronounce any of this stuff. I'm, I'm trying to pronounce like German names. I'm not very used to that, so... Um, I'll do my best. Um, and then there's tons of wild fantasy names, which I'm sure I'll mangle, but I feel less, <laughs> rest, less bad about that. Um, but before we get into it, just generally, like, what was your experience like reading this book? Um, pros and cons. What did you like? Was there anything you didn't like? Yeah. What were your thoughts? Uh, I enjoyed like sort of this nostalgic journey. I, you know, I was thinking about the fact that there's so many books that I read that are this sort of fantasy format where it's in a fantasy world with crazy fantasy names and princesses and dragons and all this stuff that I don't even remember the name of reading growing up. You know what I mean? There's like just th- like the like stories. unknown books you read at some point and yeah, just that, like, that, yeah, that I have no idea the titles of and things like that when and no idea when I read them. But I um, it made me nostalgic for those sort of stories. And when I wasn't necessarily like I was just willing to read whatever if it had like a dragon in it. And, it, yeah. you know, like uh, I was I was very forgiving uh, if it wasn't maybe the most well-written book. But uh, yeah, for me, it was Tor. It was like if I saw the Tor symbol on the spine. Yeah. Uh, in, in, a, in a bookstore I was like oh this is going to be something I'm going to like it was a, it, it was it was a combination of like two things it had the tour symbol on it and then there was usually a dragon on the cover and I was like this is a book for me <laughs> <laughs> nice uh so that I you know that portion I liked I liked sort of reliving some of that but then there there were parts of this that I feel like lived up to the title never ending story and maybe it was because I was coming in with the knowledge of the movie but it felt like there were certain like conclusion points and sort of truncated sections that could have been ma- made but uh, again that's in keeping with sort of the fantasy theme here is like some of them so especially I would say probably older fantasy novels uh, tended to just kind of meander through the story and and like not worry too much about like how how well plotted it was i i don't know i guess i started to feel the weight of the the story at some point it just felt like i was uh yeah i think you're talking about pacing issues and i completely agree i think especially in the second half of the book it starts to drag um i think it has some pretty significant pacing issues but um i i do want to begin with positives though um this book to me the the stuff that it's about And tackling it in a children's book is really interesting because it is about the magic of reading and it is about the psych secret life of stories and it's it's surreal and it starts to become about the relationship between a reader and the material And, and I love the idea of like the the intermingling of the two, like how truly the reader breathes life into the words. And and I think that's true. Um, Any writer, you know, knows that you only do half the work and the other half is left to the reader. Every reader will bring their own, you know, perspective and biases and everything else with them when they pick up whatever material and they'll read a different story. (laughs) Like all every reader reads something slightly different just based off of that alone. And I think more so in books than you get in like a movie. Uh, I feel like movies, uh, obviously there's lots of areas for interpretation, but um, the nature of having so many things you can like see and point to and go look at that um, versus the interpretive nature of text, right? Like it it all exists in the realm of our imagination, which is what this book's all about. 
it feels to me like filmmakers take their interpretation of what they're reading off the page and give you their experience of having read something so they're like this is my version it's like this is what i imagined so i'm gonna put it on screen yeah and um that's what this book's all about so if you like the idea of like that distinction being made almost literal and turned into a magic system and turned into world building um that's what happens and we get this really cool framing device of this young boy going into a bookstore finding this book steals it and then he's reading it and then he's it's it's very over the top like like you were saying very old classic style almost sword and sorcery feel um fantasy and then it starts to twist a little bit and um it starts to become apparent that he is in some ways affecting the story and the story is in some ways reflecting him and interacting with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, the characters inside the story can start to get glimpses of him and vice versa. And um, my mind was getting blown and I'm like, I'm so into it. And like somewhere around the midway point, I'm not sure exactly where, where um, it feels like the end of the book and it feels like we start a second book. So I completely agree with you there. I think, um, I think this book would benefit from being split into two volumes. Um, but but because it's not, um, I I sort of get adrift towards the middle, and yeah. um, it starts to drag. There's a lot that starts to happen that doesn't feel as important for various reasons. We'll get into, and then it starts to like it starts to recoup. I think towards the end, I think it, it comes back around. It has some really interesting lessons, and I, I like the way it ends. Um, but it, there is a bit of a slog uh, chunk in this book that is a little bit tough. And, and it's the one like misgiving I have the book that uh, about the book that keeps me from giving that this like glowing recommendation. Everyone should go read it because I was ready to give it that pretty early on. Cause I was loving everything. Um, mm-hmm. But, but then, yeah, that, that just holds it back a bit for me. Yeah. We're just traveling this too many locations too quickly. It feels like we're just kind of like flying by situations and re you know, going back to places we've been before and all of it, it just so much. It felt like it could definitely have used another additional, I don't know, been its own book and it had an additional like 50 pages or something to co- sort of like slow things down a little bit because I, I feel like the pacing isn't the same in the first half and in the second half it doesn't feel like uh the same kind of book and, and, know, I have some which, interesting like theories about why that may be the case which we can get into once we get into actual spoilers the way that this story sort of engaged with like losing yourself in a fantasy story how that can be so exciting and magical and then how at some points it can be, you know, overtaking your life and like how anything and stories in general can start to um, become a negative and, and it's sort of like your real life and, and the world that you live and all these books and all this entertainment that you consume, like they can coexist. But there is a there is a fine line somewhere to sort of still address the things that are going on in your own life and then lose yourself in a fantasy story for the escapism sometimes and and how the two can reflect each other as well. Like you can learn something about yourself that can help you deal with something in your real life in a fantasy story that you were never expecting to learn. Uh, and I do like that that like sort of lesson for people who are reading it that way. I love that too. It it's not just all rosy, right? It's not just all about how great stories are. They're the best. Let's just you know revel in how great stories are. There's a bit of that, but then you're right. There there is definitely also a here are here's the dangers of it. You can lose yourself. You can um, if you start to fail to take the lessons that you learn in the fiction and apply them to your life then you'll lose your memory and you'll you'll sort of become hollowed out and you'll become distance from yourself your true self i guess and um you know there's a danger to that and then and then also the idea of like fiction has this power to change belief and to change people's minds um and and but it is shown as being both a positive and a negative like it can also be what will lead people to do hate evil things and lead people down the wrong path. Um, so, so it's not shown as like a purely good thing. It's, it's, it's both good and dangerous um, depending on how it's dealt with. And I, I think that's a really cool message and a very nuanced, complicated one to have in a children's novel. Yeah. Which, you know, I, I think is cool. I think I would have really liked this as a kid. I'm kind of sad to read it as a kid. I thought the same thing. Uh, the way that it, I think it's really beautiful that like art can do that, right? Like if you sat someone down and you had different beliefs than them and you had a conversation, they might not, it's too, it's almost too confrontational. And the way that like art 
can sort of like let someone experience this in a passive like subliminal way almost even sometimes mm -hmm. like to to sort of clearly this this uh main character is is president enough to know like things are going on in his life and things aren't great with his father and all of this and then uh as time goes on it's cool to see like he can't confront that in the real world but he finds escape in this story and then eventually that does help him you know uh sort of puzzle, work through the puzzle to figure out his life so yeah i love that um i i do recommend this book for anybody who who that sounds interesting like if but i will say if you're the kind of person who's turned off by too much like meta analysis um if it feels like too on the nose like uh talking about what stories are like if that frustrates you you know if like if you don't like the framing device and you know the princess bride things like that then then you might you might struggle with this book um and then also just be prepared for a bit of a slog in the middle but otherwise i do recommend the book i think it's cool it goes a lot of places that the movie doesn't go uh we'll, we'll know more next week when we rewatch it and i'm sure we'll talk about it more i do think if you're a fan of the movie that you should give this a shot because it is really f interesting the way that it like sort of uh, the things that you're familiar with from the first movie, it, it sort of extrapolates on some of those and it, it kind of gives better context, at least in my memory. I, I don't remember how well all of this. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember it being explained as well as in the yeah. book. So it, there's something nice about that. And honestly, if you're a fan, a fan of fantasy and remembered reading a lot of fantasy growing up, then I think that you would get a kick out of it. It's fun to like the nostalgia ride is there if you if you want to take it. Yeah. OK, so let's talk about the author, Mikhail Andres Helmuth. Inda. The only time I'm going to say that whole full name, hopefully I got that somewhat right. Um, he is the son of a surrealist painter named Edgar Inda, uh, born in Bavaria, but moved to the or artist quarter of Munich when he was a young boy. So he was born in 1929. Um, he would grow up during World War II, which was in incredibly influential onto his work. Uh, his father's paintings were deemed degenerate and banned by the Nazi party. Um, his father had to continue to work in secret um, and hide a lot of his art because it was, it was illegal. Um, he experienced, uh, uh, Mikhail experienced his first air raids at the age of 12. And this is an interesting bit, which I, was reminding me a little bit of what we covered, uh, our previous project, Slaughterhouse-Five. This was him reflecting on uh, the first time he saw uh, these air raids that took place in Munich. Our street was consumed by flames. The fires didn't crackle, it roared. The flames were roaring. I remember singing and careering through the blaze like a drunkard. I was in the grip of a kind of euphoria. I still don't truly understand it, but I was almost tempted to cast myself into the fire like a moth into the light. So that's interesting, right? Like the, the pull of this destruction. And then I think we see that reflected in this book with the nothing, uh, which we can talk to. We, we see people sort of getting pulled to, to you know, go towards the, the nothing, which I know we haven't gotten to spoilers yet. So, but it, this <laughs> is a thing that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Isn't it interesting, though, how we have this connection, right? Two, two projects back to back. The author's heavily influenced by the bombings in World yeah. War II. Very when I was reading when I was reading the book, I was thinking about making a joke in, on the podcast about how we went from Slaughterhouse Five to something very different, and how like oh can you believe can you believe how different these really are? And it's always interesting how like our our projects tend to have like some sort of connective tissue along yeah. the way somewhere or another. That, this one absolutely does. You know, it, like you said, they're they're ostensibly different, but they're also both um, form breaking in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, and, and about what it means to tell a story in different ways. So there's a lot of connective tissue there. So uh, Mikhail was drafted at the age of 14 to join the uh, Axis powers, the Nazis, uh, in war against the Allies. Uh, three of his friends would die in their first day as they got joined the service, by the way. Um, but he tore up his draft papers and instead joined a resistance movement that sabotaged the SS. And he served as a courier throughout the the remainder of the war for this resistance movement. So, Jeez, that's hardcore. Pretty badass, I think. <laughs> badass. <laughs> you know, props to him. After the war, he became a playwright and an actor. Um, in 1952, he would meet the actress Inberg Hoffman. Probably mispronounced that. Um, at a party. Uh, she was eight years older than him, uh, but he ended up uh, winning her over with his love of poetry 
and um, he found her just fascinating from everything I was reading. And um, it would be years later, but they would end up getting married. Um, and she became a very important part of his creative life because she would help him with his writing. She she um, encouraged him to finish projects. Um, you know, it, very involved, it seemed like, uh, in his creative work. Um, so in 1959, he would publish a, um, a play, um, but it wouldn't be until 1960 that his first novel would come out. Um, now, this, this novel was called Jim Button. Um, and it was, uh, I believe, a fantasy, a children's fantasy story. Um, he had tried to get it published for many years and it received just countless rejections. Um, you know, stop me if you've heard this before in the journey yeah, right. of an author, right? Like, this is so <laughs> common. Um, countless uh, rejections. Finally, he, he got accepted by this small, like, independent publisher who was going to, you know, t- they, and they forced him to split it into two volumes. It was overly long. Um, and he finally agreed to do that. Um, the first one came out in 1960, and it, w- it went on to win the Berlin Literary Prize for Youth Fiction, um, which all of a sudden sort of put him on the map, and he became uh, able to like pay off his back rent that he was like in court over and all, all this stuff. Like he was really struggling at the time, and then turned it all around with the publication of this book. His wife would also help ur- urge him to join the humanistic movement, um, and so he would campaign for peace. Um, became an outspoken um, uh, demonstrator and went around to different protests and stuff. And uh, him and his wife were, I don't know, I just think it's really cool that they were humanists and and, uh, that's something that I really like and, and, you know, that's a a thing that I ascribe to. So very cool to see that from these two. Um, Yeah. uh, So he would write The NeverEnding Story in 1979 Unfortunately, his wife died unexpectedly from a pulmonary embolism when she was 63 in 1985. Uh, So he he went through this tragedy and the movie is coming out. And um, from everything I was reading, he was not happy about the changes that were being made. He tries to sue to get the production stopped um, or to fix it and not change everything. Like, I think he really wanted the second half of the book included. I felt like it was essential to the story, but he lost the suit and uh, the movie ended up getting made. So he was not a fan of it, um, which, it, you know, that's that's sad to see, especially when it goes on to have this great following. Uh, one thing that's also interesting is that he was fascinated by Japanese culture. Um, he he ma- ha- traveled to Japan many times and he ended up remarrying after his wife died. I think after four years after her death, he remarried... Um, a translator who worked on translations of his book from German into Japanese. And um, his books are incredibly popular, not only in Germany, but in Japan. Apparently, he's more famous for his books in both Germany and Japan than the film, which is what most English speakers know The NeverEnding Story as. Wow. That's cool. So for whatever reason, it's just not quite as popular as a book for us English speakers, but in Japan, apparently very, very popular. Um, his works have been translated into more than 40 languages, sold more than 35 million copies, um, and have been adapted into motion pictures, stage plays, operas, and audiobooks. Anda is one of the most popular and famous German authors of the 20th century, mostly due to the enormous success of his children's fiction. Uh, he was not strictly a children's writer, as he wrote books for adults as well, and Anda's writing can be described as a surreal mixture of reality and fantasy. And I was looking at some of the paintings of his of his father it is i i don't know that i've seen it before but it's of us it's of a kind i have like that surrealist movement that like salvador right. dali like that kind of stuff i'm mm-hmm. um, really fascinating a little bit darker i would say than a lot of the dalis i've seen very cool and to think about his father who is who's like having to secretly paint you know right. labeled a degenerate and then his son who who grows up and has this book that's all about the nature of art and its power and how it interacts with us and um, I don't know. I just feel like he had a ton to say and, and a lot of interesting ideas about imagination and, and the power that art has and our, the role that it plays in our society and in our lives. And um, when I yeah. think about all of that, it makes me like this book uh, even more. Me too. Yeah. The, I mean, the idea of having a surrealist painter as a father and just like walking around the house and seeing these and how that must like inform so much of your life and, and like what that I don't know, the way that you approach art and and clearly it did have an effect. Yeah, I mean, and, and the, a, lot of, a lot of the fantasy in this book feels almost surrealist, like a surrealist painting, like loosely explained, 
bizarre, just like strung together and loosely connected. Things mm-hmm. don't like make logical sense sometimes to just go with it. Like, so I could totally see that influence. Um, we got to move on to talk about the plot, but I just want to end on this quote. Um, I thought that, two quotes that I thought were really interesting. Um, one, when talking about his writing, he said, quote, it is for this child in me and in all of us that I tell my stories. And then he went on to say, my books are for any child between 80 and eight years old. <laughs> so, nice. you know, again, he, he, he faced a lot of criticism from people who were saying he's not like a serious literary mind because he wrote for kids. And that was something he pushed back against for a long time. And that he can, he said, you know, writing fantasy and writing children's literature in particular, like a lot of people didn't want to take him seriously as, as a, as a writer. Um, and I can see that that was very frustrating. Um, also did not have any children of his own. I don't know if there was a reason for that, but, um, I, I think it's interesting when you consider like Dr. Seuss, we talked about, didn't have any kids, like some of these children's authors, I think, um, where the wild things are, uh, Marie Sendak also no mm-hmm. children, so, you know, it's interesting, like, this reclaiming of youth by these these authors who don't have children of their own. I don't know. It seems yeah. like there's an interesting correlation there, at least. Yeah, definitely. The So you were talking about darkness in The Father's Painting, too, which I want to say, like, this this story does have an undercurrent of some pretty dark stuff. Uh, and it does, it allows, and I think that's to be respected in some children's stories, too. Like, I think kids, you know, I, I'm just going to say this in this episode, and we can readdress it in the film episode, like, this story uh, terrified me and made me face my mortality, I think, for maybe the first time in my entire life. Yeah. And like, the, you know, the story has that in there. You know, it's not just the film that does that. So I think it's to be respected when you have when you take it seriously and have danger and, and like death potentially and, and some of that other stuff in these stories, because it is formative for kids. And, and uh, you know, it, it lends it a lot more weight because it's realistic in that way. Yeah, I mean, very heavy. There's a point early on where Bastion goes into this bookstore and the guy, Coriander, I believe, the the guy who's owning the store tells him, we don't have any books for children here. And I just yeah. thought it was, it, it was a, a cool little nod to how, like, when you're a kid, like, you want to read, I, I wanted to read adult stuff, you know? Like, I want yeah. and, and so the idea that, like, he's kind of saying, like, what we're reading isn't really an, a children's book, even though ostensibly it is. I don't know. It was It's kind of operating in this instant space between what you would expect for a children's book and and definitely a lot more adult or serious topics yeah. and even just outside of like mortality stuff like there's there's plenty of dark really ominous like existential threats and things that as a kid you're like holy shit like what the fuck is going on <laughs> yeah and you know and maybe some of it to the detriment of the story um for for, for a, a child you know who's reading this i i can see that maybe some of it would be above your head or you might find it a little bit boring i don't know like i'd be really i wish i could like have uh you know a 12 year old me chime in on the podcast and let me know what he thought of it because i think it would be a very different read than uh what i was able to take away now from it you know the things when i was a kid that went over my head that i sort of just read by and yes they went over my head but i still ended up overall as i said sort of just pushing through anything i was reading and basically just enjoying reading anything yeah so it's like even if even if it did go over a kid's head i wonder if it would bother them you know yeah. or they'd just be like oh yeah well one nothing. thing i think that plays in the benefit for a kid is i i took everything at face value in, in a sense when i was young reader like i i guess what i'm trying to say is also when i would read a fantasy book and it was like, there was a dragon. I'm like, okay, there's a dragon. And I, I picture the dragon and that dragon was real to me. And I was right. like imagining what it would be like. And I didn't question it. I didn't compare it because I hadn't read a ton of stuff. So I wasn't like, well, how did this dragon stack up to this other dragon I read about? You know, what's the technique being like? I didn't know enough about writing. So like. Well, and it's like, did did the dragon represent something else? Um, like, it was a, the dragon a metaphor or an allegory for something yeah, in life? Yeah, I'm not thinking about that. It's a fucking dragon, you know? <laughs> and, I, and I was, like, astounded at the idea of something weird, you know? And there's lots of weird shit in this book. And I think if you're the kind of kid who can just full bore go into it and um, let your imagination run wild and embrace everything that he's describing... There's a ton of weird stuff in here, and um, it would feel like my brain was exploding a little bit, and yeah. um, maybe a little bit overwhelming. But uh, you know, I could see being a very cool, and and in some places that was a bit of a stumbling block for me. Now, 
because I kind of can see the code of the story and I know what he's trying to accomplish and I know what seems to be important and what seems to not be important. And there were right. times where I was like, eh, I don't know if this is actually important for me. And, and I would get a little bit, you know, yeah. less engaged. Um, yeah. So, you know, I don't know. It, it is, it's interesting how, how different I am as a reader now, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, we're just jaded now. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing I did see that I thought was interesting from a writing point of view is him talking about being a pantser. Um, and that doesn't surprise me with the nature of the story a little bit. Um, now, he's specifically talking about writing his first novel, Jim Button, but he says, I sat down at my desk and wrote, quote, The country in which the engine driver Luke lived was Morrowland. It was a rather small country. Once I'd written the two lines, I hadn't a clue how the third line might go. I didn't start out with a concept or a plan. I just let myself drift from one sentence and one thought to the next. That's how I discovered that writing could be an adventure. The story carried on growing. New characters started appearing. And to my astonishment, different plot lines began to weave together. The manuscript was getting longer all the time and was already much more than a picture book. I finally wrote the last sentence 10 months later and a great stack of paper had accumulated on my desk. I think that's interesting because that shows sort of his method, right? Of just following his strings of thought. And <laughs> remember um, that part that I was saying we were jumping from place to place and going all over. The, like, yeah. I, I think I know why now. <laughs> yeah, he's just he's just going. He's not plotting yeah. this out. He's not thinking about any sort of structure. To me, he's just like, I'm just going to write the next thing and then the next thing and then this thing happens and then this thing happens. And there gets to be a lot of that at times, where it's like. They go on adventures and then this one thing leads to the next thing and leads to the next thing and they're loosely connected and um, it doesn't really feel like there's this big plan necessarily at work all the time. Um, But, you know, it it comes back around and like I said, it has a satisfying ending. So props to him for being able to do that because that can be very difficult. Um, I also am a bit of a pantser when it comes to my writing. I wouldn't say I'm quite like this. I'm somewhere in the middle. I I try and have some plans about where I'm going to go without necessarily knowing everything. Um, but this is very like, I don't even know anything. I'm just writing sentence after sentence. And and that can be very difficult to do, (laughs) to write into the darkness like that. Yeah. I assume at some point he must have thought, okay, I I have an ending in mind and it's just sort of like getting there. I would, I would assume because other, like, what are you thinking about when you lay in bed at night? Like just the, only the next thing and not the the eventual I don't know. I mean, everybody's different. There are writers who do it that way. And they're, you know, writers don't only, only know the ending when they get there sometimes, you know? Yeah. There, and then there are a lots of writers who swear by knowing the ending before they ever write the beginning. Like, and, and feel, they feel like that is an absolute must. And they, they you know, if they want to be able to yeah. finish something, they have to know where they're going. So, and then you have people who meticulously plot every single thing, like, uh, like a Brandon Sanderson famous for plotting out his books. Like he plots out every chapter and then he plots out like every beat, like story beats within the chapters. And he has this big skeleton before he sits down to write his books. Um, you know, there's lots of different approaches, approaches, and there's different pros and cons. I think, and and then I think a lot of it just has to do with like how the author's mind works, um, because that to me, like I think about that, and I'm like that could never work for me. So it's just like my brain doesn't work that way, and and a lot of people's don't. So you know, I think it's more about finding what works for you, which is something I'm still trying to do. I should say, <laughs> uh, always on a you know never ending uh, story journey to to. To story to find uh, how to do that. So uh, we got to get into some plot here. So the book centers on a boy, Bastian Balthazar Books, an overweight and strange child who is neglected by his father after the death of Bastian's mother. While escaping from bullies, Bastian bursts into the bookstore of Carl Conrad Coriander, where he finds a book called The Neverending Story. Unable to resist, he steals the book and hides in his school's attic, where he begins to read. The story Bastion reads is set in the magical land of Fantastica, a place of wonder ruled by the benevolent and mysterious childlike empress. A great delegation has come to the empress to seek her help against a formless entity called the Nothing. The delegates are shocked when the empress's physician, a centaur named Charon, informs them that the empress is ill and has chosen a boy warrior named Atreyu to find a cure. Upon finding Atreyu, Charon gives him Orin, a powerful medallion that protects him from all harm. At the advice of the giant turtle Morla, the aged one, 
Atreyu sets off in search of an invisible oracle known as Yuyulala, who may know the Empress's cure. In reaching her, he is aided by a luck dragon named Falcor, whom he rescues from a creature, Yigrimul, the many. By Yuyulala, he is told the only thing that can save the Empress is a new name given to her by a human who can only be found beyond Fantastica's borders. Okay. I was so, trying so hard not to laugh. <laughs> so many names, and they're wild the names. names. Yeah. yeah, for sure. To be expected, I guess, in a, in a fantasy story like this. Uh, do you think that he thought he was really clever when the, la- when the f- character's last name was Books, B-U-X? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I, here's the other thing we should also say. This We are reading the translated version of this, not in the original yeah, German. So That's true. I don't know how much of this. One thing that was really interesting in my copy of the book, um, and I'm sure in all copies, <laughs> um, every chapter begins with like a big letter. Um, you know, like this is a frequent thing where like the big letter is the first letter of the first word in that chapter, but it's um, A through Z in in order. So the very first chapter begins with a big that. A, the second letter yeah. begins with a big B, and and goes so and goes all the way to Z. The final chapter begins That's with a big awesome. Z. Um, I didn't even realize that. And what's interesting is like, it does it, how do they translate that? Like I, I, German uses the same general alphabet as we use, so I wonder if that is that must be true in the German case as well, and that must have been a challenge of of translation to make sure everything still made sense, but yet could right. maintain that that trick i don't know well yeah you're gonna have you're gonna have to make some choices right to change to change words in that way and be so specific yeah you know maybe they just started it with like a a basic word i don't know well sometimes sometimes it is a lot of times it's a name i don't know like to what end other than just being it's kind of cool i guess it's like it kind of gave me a sense of like oh i'm curious to see how he's going to do the next one so i was i was kind of curious for that yeah that's fun but yeah, I mean, let's talk about it. Like this, this entrance into the story, Bastion. Maybe let's start with the framing device. What did you think of Bastion and his journey into the bookstore? I loved it, honestly, and and I, I'm not ashamed to admit that like I was really getting sucked into his story. And then when we first jumped into the fantasy story, I was like, oof, here we go, because yeah. I was kind of like really fascinated with what was going on there, and and I like. I loved the sort of like heist that he did and, you know, ran, I guess it wasn't a heist. He didn't plan it, but he, he stole the book and yep. um, the way the interactions they were having and he's like hiding in the attic and I just found it to be really engaging. And then, uh, you know, part of it is cool because I was looking forward to when we would click back out of the fantasy story to see, to check in. And eventually I did, you know, I, I clicked into the fantasy story as well, but I just love that framing device. I thought that was a lot of fun and You know, I I also loved uh, there's a specific part where it's being talked about, like, if you haven't ever, like, snuck under the sheets to, like, read a book when nobody when you were supposed to be asleep or something like that, like that being said, like that, I did that so many times. Yeah. And and it's funny in hindsight to think, like, of course, we need to get our sleep or whatever. But like, I'm sure parents nowadays would be overjoyed with their kids, like sneaking to (laughs) to read books and stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, But that was something that, like, I very obviously did. And and. uh, I, I thought that was pretty nice. Nice to get a shout out like that. I agree. Many a late night spent under a blanket with a flashlight or something, hoping not yeah. to, you know, catch any attention while I'm trying to and read. And it's not comfortable either. It's not. But you're a kid, so like your neck can like sit in a terrible yeah. angle for hours, and you'll be fine. <laughs> you're having to hold the book up sometimes, and you can't get a good angle. It to gets read hot what's in there. In the flashlight, yeah. <laughs> uh, absolutely, but I mean, is again, I think we've talked about this before. It's smart to make the main character a reader, like especially for a kid. It's like you're reading it, and you're like, "Ooh, I'm like that. I like books. I'm like this bastard." You immediately see yourself right in 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 this character. Yep. I also there was a line where he talks about how he he hates it when authors talk about humdrum people living humdrum lives. And he's like, talk to me about the fantasy world. That's all I care about. Yeah. And of course, it's super meta because that's exactly what's happening every time we touch back in with Bastion, who is in you know his humdrum life. Um, so I, I love that he sort of lampshades it there. And that yeah. that kind of little playfulness, I think, is, is super cool throughout. And uh, every time it happened, I, I liked it. But yeah, I mean, I, I kind of remember some of these characters. I remember the big rock guy. That's one that definitely stands out. I think I remember there being a big rock bicycle, which is very silly and weird. And I think I remember that's in the movie. <laughs> I don't um, remember that. But... Cause, and then like the one guy rides on a snail and the other guy's on a bat. Right. Um, you know, these three messengers. And I thought they were going to be more important characters. But like a lot of characters other than maybe Atreyu and Falcor, 
like they get introduced, they do some stuff and then they go away and then like they rarely sort of circle back and become important again. Yeah, which which it's nice for layering in characters and world building in that way. But also some of the time, like you said, I could kind of feel that these characters weren't going to stick around. And I was like, all right, all right. On to the, let's see. Let's see what's going to happen. Next. Yeah. Yeah. What's going to happen with the tree, uh, which, by the way, in case uh, anyone is aware of the band of tree, you it is yes. named after this character. Oh, sweet. I did not. I didn't know that like was confirmed. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. They named it after this, this character. Very cool. Uh, very cool. Which apparently in, in their, in this, within the story, I don't know if it means this in, in some other language, but Atreyu means like raised by the people instead yeah. of being. So I like that. That's cool. Yeah. And Bastion, I mean, Bastion sees a lot of himself in Atreyu, yet he doesn't feel like he's as, it's like an aspirational version of himself because he's like, oh, I'm not as like fit and I'm not as brave and I'm not as you know all this stuff as as you know him but we were both sort of raised by the community and he felt like after his mother died that was true for him as well um yep. and he feels distance from his father who is clearly suffering from depression i think it's described how yeah. like nothing matters to him everything's for sort sure. of he's lost all joy and he doesn't seem to care you'll just find him like staring off into space instead of watching tv and stuff like that um, yeah. And then you see the the sort of force behind the destruction of this world is the nothing. And it's described as this sort of like deletion. It's this like it is truly nothingness that is swallowing things up. Um, I love the it, way it was described as like look, if you were to look at it, it almost feels like going blind like you yeah. or like the way that it's it's not even that you're like seeing something black or anything come towards you. It's like a lack of anything. Yeah, which is something we, we talked about this, I think, in Howl's Moving Castle. I think the door was described as being like that, and um, it's it's one of those things you can only, you, you can't really imagine, and you can't put it on a screen. So it's it's yeah. can exist in this this realm of imagination. I thought it was really interesting how he would encounter people who'd like lost limbs to it, and they would say that it wasn't painful, that whatever yeah. went in there was just gone now, um, which is like kind of chilling. I don't know, it's like a spooky to me. Yeah, I definitely had a moment where I was thinking about that too. I was like, damn, like what would that be like? Yeah. And I don't know, to me, it, it does seem to represent like a depression, like um, mm -hmm. that sort of like lack of joy and just like being very blah, like well, um, it's literally sucking the life out of everything. Yeah. Like, you know. Yeah. Um, Atreyu gets introduced down. Now he, and Atreyu in the book is, is this like green skinned, like plains warrior, but but a child. He's like 10 years old and he gets tasked with this quest to go find a way to cure the child empress. Um, and he goes, he goes on this quest and we follow him and we meet Falcor, who, which by the way, like, I think is one of the probably most famous fantasy dragons out there. I think probably in the top 10, Up there. 15. Yeah. Um, dog dragon. Yeah. This dog dragon <laughs> It's the luck dragon is described in the yeah, book. He's, he talks, um, you know, he, he doesn't have big floppy ears in the book. I don't think, which is how I, I kept so imagining either, him. Yeah. Cause that's what he has in the movie. Oh, uh, I, the entire time I was imagining. Falcor from the movie. <laughs> uh, very interested to see to see that again because I, like, I love dogs and I love dragons and I liked Falcor a lot, but I also remember it being kind of weird and unsettling. Like the it yeah. was like a, this weird blend of the two and the way that like yeah. puppetry is a little bit like uncanny. Um, so right. I remember it's like as much as I liked Falcor, I was also like afraid of Falcor a little bit. Right. You know. So. Yeah. This movie. This. I, phew, this movie goes deep for me. There's a lot of roots of. <laughs> trauma in this almost like there's like uh so i like this i watched this movie a lot we'll talk about it more but I, and it also reminds me of a movie like labyrinth or like um the dark crystal like watching these like these these like it's amazing practical effects and everything that's going on the puppetry at work and all this stuff but in some ways it's also really scary sometimes oh, absolutely. and like you said even falcor just like the way that he talks the way that he it's just all fr pretty freaky when you're a kid yeah and uh, we, we covered Enemy Mine, I think, by by the same director um, and had a lot of similar effects. Yeah, Wolfgang Peterson. And, um, you know, I'll be interested to, to actually go back to the well, well the more well-known uh, version, uh, you know, more well-known movie. Um, anyway, excited for that. But we got to talk about Artax, um, the horse. Yes. So Artax, the horse, talks in the book. I don't remember him talking in the movie. I could be wrong about that, but I, I don't remember him talking. He's talking to to Atreyu and he starts getting super depressed because apparently he is like he's walking in the swamp of sorrow and he starts sinking in and he's like losing all will to live. 
And Atreyu is like, I don't feel that way. What's going on? And they're like, oh, you're protected by the by the medallion that the Empress, uh, the childlike Empress gave you. Um, and <laughs> I don't. It's so weird. He's just like sinking. And and Atreyu's like, let me let me help you. And he's like, no, leave me be. It's too late for me. I'm gone. And he's like, half of his horse head is like covered in muck. And he's like, D- one request: leave and don't see me die. <laughs> It'll be too sad. And and Atreus like okay <laughs> turns around. And well, leaves. he does say like he he attempts to give him the amulet, and he's like, no, 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 I don't yeah. want you to, to risk it like this happening to you too. But goddamn, if it isn't, sad. I mean, he's yeah. sad, and like Bastion is weeping in the real world, so it is supposed to right. be a sad moment. But it's a we- it's a weird <laughs> moment, and it comes out of nowhere. Um, and definitely doesn't hit yeah. me like it used to when I was a kid. I'll say that, but still. Some deep seated stuff there. Yeah, and and in some ways it's like darker. Like I don't know, something about seeing the horse in the movie is very traumatic. Like I, a lot of people like talk about that scene. Um, so I'll, I'll be curious to compare the two. But having him talk the whole time and sort of narrate his own like, well, here I go. I'm I'm a lost cause now. I'm sinking in. Better just leave me behind. Um, it was really weird. Very very weird moment. I mean, so much happens. Like we we. we I feel like we're flying by all kinds of stuff, but it's like, it's so many times like a Treyu and then later Bastion, they're like just like encountering some big fantasy creature and having a conversation with it. Like, you know, this big turtle. Um, and every time they like basically gives them like a breadcrumb of like, this is the next place you need to go to get this next thing you need. Um, and a lot of the story works that way. And so it has this sort of adventure feel throughout. I liked getting more of the world. I liked fleshing it out in this way. The childlike empress is an interesting character and the interesting idea of having this like ancient entity sort of be benevolent and like uh, seeing over all. Uh, and yet she's like losing her power seemingly or like, like well, dying. She's like a figurehead too. I, I li- actually liked it because I was thinking about how in so much of our fantasy, it's sort of like, props up the idea of a monarchy like one just like all powerful ruler who has you know everybody's best interest in mind and how like what we should really want is like aragorn at the end of lord of the rings we want like the uh, the good king not a destruction of the monarchy <laughs> um but what's interesting here is this childlike empress doesn't ever command anybody to do anything really it's more uh, like suggestions and yeah but then like... also like yeah, she has this like weird like hands-off approach to everything apparently. So she's a ruler like more as like a figurehead, like a, almost a spiritual or a god. ruler. Yeah, like, yeah, like a god. Like, because everybody sort of worships her and they they see her as like the reason they exist. So there is some inter- interesting like spiritualism going on here and I'm sure depending on your faith you may read different things into it or lack of faith you may you may look at it as more of a psychological uh, manifestation which is how i tended to see it like almost Jungian stuff going on throughout this this story but um it, it's it's very interesting there's a lot of stuff going on there and it's very layered um and would go over the head of many children i'm sure and and speaking of this this turtle this turtle um i almost said turtle like D D. turtle um <laughs> this turtle uh i thought it was it was fascinating how the turtle turtle i said it again the turtle (laughs) um sort of embodied like nihilism and how nothing matters and like being old and it was also had something to do with age it was like when you're as old as i am you'll see that everything is nothing is new nothing matters i've given up all hope and and um uh, very defeatist in a way and and and, uh how that is set against atreyu's youth and optimism um i think says something about children's literature right and like why people find it important to impart lessons onto young people i think through children's literature like how how, how, like children are the future kind of thing right and like how sometimes older people can be more jaded um and maybe unwilling to change and how people who are younger still have hope and still are more more able to mold i guess um yeah, I don't know. In a blanket it, statement sense, I would say. I guess. No, no, yeah. I don't necessarily agree yeah. with that, but I felt like that was some of the messaging being layered yeah. in here. Um, Could you know, be. Yeah. It's. I think it's something you have to fight against as you get older, right? Like you have to fight yeah. against getting too set in your ways and unwilling to learn and unwilling right. to grow anymore. And you, it, to me, if I if I ever felt like I I've arrived as a person, I have no more growth to have. Like then I've then I'm you know I'm doomed to failure at that point. Like we should always be trying to improve ourselves and 
Um, yeah. I think that's a, a lifelong endeavor. So two things that before we move to the next part is I think there was like an oracle of some kind. I thought that was the person who was really old for some reason, or was it the was it? The, I can't remember. There's a lot the of really two, old but... characters. Yeah, I'll just say that. <laughs> I think the oracle yeah. is also old. Um, anyway, yeah. uh, eventually, uh, Treyu gets to the point where he sees Falcor like captured by this this like spider thing, and I couldn't help yeah. but think of Shelob. And just this idea of having a spider creature in your fantasy story. Yeah. Well, it was like a spider thing, but also like, wasn't it like many. an air elemental kind of thing too? Like it had many different sh- many different shapes and I don't know. Uh, well, they go, so the, they, they do the thing with the, it could be, but they also do the thing with the spider that eventually they get on Falcor and then they fly up in the sky and then there's like four giant air elementals like yeah. fighting each other. Yeah. So that happens. There's that too. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> And then he loses the thing, and we already talked about it. In yeah. The, in the, we can't we can't go over everything that happens. I'm just realizing that right now. It's just not it's just not possible. It's it'll take too long. One thing before we move on, this introduction of a figure outside the book, right? This is where it first gets introduced, and it's like we mm-hmm. need somebody to to name the empress, and all of a sudden, like the spotlight shifts to Bastion, right? And he's like, wait a minute, who are they talking about? And he starts to go, well, it can't be me. I just thought that was a really interesting fourth wall breaky moment um, where the story comes alive and says like the, the savior that we've been looking for is actually you, the reader and, and right. points at Bastion. And I don't know, that was a very like, Whoa moment for me. Um, and I think where it deals with this is going to be the biggest change, right? Like going forward, what happens with Bastion, I assume in the movie, I have very little memory of it compared to what happens in the book. I think it's going to be the biggest departure. Yeah. I, I can't remember how it's dealt with. I just know I can't remember, honestly. I think there's some in and out. I don't remember how specifically they engage with him in that way. But uh, I did. I mean, these are some of my favorite parts is when he's like he like gets the, the name right away. He's like, if I was to name it, it would be Moonchild, you know, like right away. He's like engaging with it and thinking like, oh, if I could do something, I would do this. And that's that's a trend for a little while here. Yeah. Okay, so, well, we've kind of gotten into the, what happens next, I'm realizing. So let me go ahead and read the next section. As Falcor and Atreyu search for the borders of Fantastica, Atreyu is flung from Falcor's back in a confrontation with the four wind giants and loses Arin in the sea. Atreyu lands in the ruins of Spook City, the home of various creatures of darkness. There, Atreyu finds the wolf Gamork, chained and near death, who tells him that all the residents of the city have leapt voluntarily into the nothing. The Fantasticans there are becoming lies in the human world. The wolf also reveals that he is a servant of the force behind the nothing and was sent to prevent the Empress's chosen hero from saving her. Gamork reveals that when the princess of the city discovered his treachery against the Empress, she imprisoned him and left him to starve. When Atreyu announces that he is the hero... The wolf laughs and succumbs to death. However, Gamork's body seizes Atreyu's leg in his jaws. Meanwhile, Falcor retrieves Arryn from the sea and arrives in time to save Atreyu from the nothing. Falcor and Atreyu go to the childlike empress, who assumes that they have brought her her rescuer. Bastion suspects that the empress means him, but cannot bring himself to believe it. When Bastion refuses to speak the new name for the empress... To prompt him into fulfilling his role as savior, the Empress herself locates the Old Man of the Wandering Mountain, who possesses a book also entitled The Neverending Story, which the Empress demands he read aloud. Bastion is amazed to find that the book he is reading is repeating itself, only this time the story includes Bastion's meeting with Coriander, his theft of the book, and all his actions in the attic. Realizing that the story will repeat itself forever without his intervention, Bastion names the Empress Moonchild and appears with her in Fantastica, where he restores its existence. The Empress has also given him Arryn, on the back of which he finds the inscription, Do What You Wish. Okay. The end. Yeah. (laughs) Uh... I mean, the moment where the guy's reading the book and he starts off and he's like reading about this bookstore and this this child coming into it and, and, and Bastion goes, well, this isn't how the book began. And then he realizes that it's like 
no, no, this is the story of how you found the book and, and the way he's like written into the story. I, I just think it's super cool. Like it's like a it's so good. Very meta yeah. moment because like you expect it to start over within the story world. But no, it starts over the actual book. And then that, that like that truly fourth wall breaking whenever it says maybe someone else is reading it right now and we don't even know. Like I that was like talking to us, right? Like the readers. Yeah, I love it. And like, you know, that's the book we're holding in our hands. That's how it begins. And we're reading all of this. So it, it sort of starts to include us in the the story in a way. It, it, it invites us in. And in in sort of a meta way, I think it's really interesting that Bastion, he is in the quote unquote real world, right? And it's only once he is able to embrace the story and like allow himself to... Um, sort of chase his imagination and and recognize that he is a piece of the story is he able to enter the story um and in the same way like he is technically fictional and a part of the book we're reading right so it would make sense that he's able to do that that's the only way he's able to do that but the implication is that if we as the reader were also able to do this we ourselves would be able to enter this book. So I could see people like getting super into this idea of like, we just got to believe enough to enter Fantastica. You didn't believe enough. Apparently nothing else happened. From Did here you on enter you? Fantastica? I got to, I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's what's considered an eighth wall break. So <laughs> we're breaking the fourth wall in that book. Did you wind up in the, um, the land of the like lost emperors or whatever, wearing a, wearing a lampshade on your head, walking just a around zombie for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the old man of wandering mountain it's so many old characters like i said um and then yeah bastion goes in names her moon child which like i i understand that that was probably a translation thing but like whenever i hear the term moon child i just think of like like a like a hippie thing right isn't that like wasn't that like a hippie thing i don't know it felt very hippie to me yeah something like that uh i also i guess i guess to go back to something we talked about before I was getting a lot of like native american uh yeah. like sort of things that were like like our main character or one of the main characters atreyu he's like a green skin which is like yeah. kind of could be a shift from something that's offensive about native american people well and he has like a vision where he's talking to a buffalo i think right stuff like that yeah, yeah. and then there's the whole like is he sitting crisscross applesauce but he calls it something different and like so like yeah a lot of that they, going he on uses where... the term indian style which is not what we should be saying and it's not what people say today but i understand that maybe in the time it he didn't know any better that's my assumption if i'm giving him the benefit of the doubt right so there, like i, I could definitely see maybe moonchild have he's like tr- you know pulling that yeah. as something that he wanted to well, do when he wrote this whatever. in 79 right and i'm sure he was yeah. affected by the 60s and you know early 70s and what was going on with all that but again it's yeah. it's german so maybe maybe moonchild you know means something different in something german. different yeah, yeah totally could be uh, we do. We should talk about Gamork, uh, the wolf. Yeah, definitely. Because this is the thing that, when I was a kid, made this too scary for me to watch really? at certain points in my life. I don't yeah, really the, remember so, Gamork. So we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it more in the in the in the movie. But specifically, this is so terrifying to me. This like embodiment of 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 like evil almost. And then, uh, yeah, it doesn't happen exactly the same in the in the movie, obviously. But I think we should definitely talk about like him getting trapped and. And then Falcor eventually coming to to rescue him, uh, and like the conversation that Gamork has, and like, wh- does that represent something to you? Like, what, what, were you, what were you thinking about that stuff? Remind me some of the stuff he says, I guess. So he basically just saying like, it doesn't matter that he's gonna die first. He's gonna have an ending, and then Atreyu because he's gonna be brought into the nothing. Like, we'll never have an ending. Like, like because Gamork dies, mm. he'll have an actual ending. Uh, and then this idea that, like, in death, even in death, he, like, clamps on to Atreyu to, like, you know, get whatever vengeance. And, and you know, uh, do we get a ton of the, uh, like, the idea of the motivations behind the nothing list? Because Gmork says specifically that they're sent by the person who's behind the nothing or whatever. Yeah. So I don't know. No, I, I felt like we didn't get a lot of that insight. But, again, to me, the, the nothing sort of represents not only depression but also, like, non-existence. And yeah. what you were saying, like, Gamork dies, and he has an end to his story, and that story itself is a lasting thing. Stories have this power, and they're eternal, in a way. But non-existence and deletion 
is something to be dreaded, I think, here. And that's what's facing Atreyu with the approach of the nothing. Like, this will destroy him and any legacy, I guess, something you talked about in our last episode. Uh, You know, he has no lasting, like, he'll never be remembered. He just won't exist anymore. Um, And just in, in a meta way, thinking about the idea of a written story, and the big bad of the written story being deletion, <laughs> um, literally like being removed from existence. I don't know. It's it's very weird to think of an author writing this and knowing that they have the power to delete at any moment and sort of imbibing their characters with life and making them not want to be deleted. And like I can see maybe this was like a really, this just seems like a trippy experience to try and write a story yeah. like this. Well, and that leads us right into the next section if you wanted to start that, but uh, specifically with like do what you wish and like this idea of like creation and and how, you know, you can how you can also it's almost like a surrogate thing where it's saying like you can also create stories. And, and yeah, you know, Bastion said to to have that skill, like have be a storyteller. OK, so let's get into it. And this is going to be the last chunk. It's a big one. For each wish, Bastion loses a memory of his life. Unaware of this at first, Bastion goes through Fantastica, having adventures and telling stories while losing his memories. In spite of the warnings of Atreyu, Bastion uses Auron to create creatures and dangers for himself to conquer, which causes some negative side effects for the rest of Fantastica. After being abetted by the wicked sorceress Zayid, And with the mysterious absence of the childlike empress, Bastion decides to take over Fantastica as emperor. During his coronation ceremony, he is stopped by Atreyu, whom Bastion grievously wounds in battle. Bastion then enters the Old Emperor City, inhabited by human beings who came to Fantastica earlier but could not find their way out, eking out a meaningless existence there. A repentant Bastion is reduced to two memories, that of his father and that of his own name. After more adventures, Bastion must give up the memory of his father to discover that the strongest wish is to be capable of love and to give love to others. On the verge of losing his final memory, Bastion is unable to find the water of life with which to leave Fantastica with his memories. Here, he is found by Atreyu. In remorse, Bastion lays down Orin at the feet of his friend, and Atreyu and Falcor enter Orin with him, where the Water of Life demands to know Bastion's name, and if Bastion has finished all the stories he began in his journey, which he has not. Only after Atreyu gives Bastion's name and promises to complete all the stories for him does the Water of Life allow Bastion to return to the human world. After drinking the Water of Life, Bastion returns to his original form and feels comfortable and happy with it. He returns to his father where he tells the full tale of his adventures and thus reconciles with him. Afterwards, Bastion confesses to Coriander about stealing his book and losing it, but Coriander denies ever owning such a book. Coriander reveals he has also been to Fantastica and that the book has likely moved into the hands of someone else and that Bastion, like Coriander, will eventually show that individual the way to Fantastica. Okay. So that's the rest of the book. Um, <laughs> I like how in that summary itself, it was like, and then he has more adventures. <laughs> Those adventures are significant. <laughs> like there's so many things that happen in this. It's book. another, that that was half the book that you just read the that's summary That's half for. the book, yeah. Like at least Not a third of the book. That's half the book. Yeah. Um, and so many things happen. There's all this stuff that happens almost as like a creation. as like the whole sort of world of Fantastica is gone and he enters and he's in this garden and he's and he's speaking with this lion and he ends up cr- almost creating Fantastica out of boredom. He's like, I, I want to go back there and he wishes for it. And he's starting to learn of his powers within this world and he learns that he has the power to wish things into existence. Um, There's literally like a grain of sand or something from t- Fantastica that's like remaining and then he like proliferates it out and creates vegetation yeah, he almost everything. has this big bang moment right where it's just like all the stuff yeah. starts growing out of it so it's more like plant-like and it grows like while he's asleep and like and he's making these wishes um he f- so there's there is like this undercurrent of like feeling a lot of shame about your body um but i think it's cast as like a shame like he he it's bad that he feels that way and he shouldn't but mm-hmm. 
I don't know. I was getting some of that. Like, by the, I think by the end it was. Yeah, right. right. But like, he also like he just desperately wants to be like a good looking, strapping young lad instead, and so he becomes that in this fantasy version of himself. And he starts getting like everything he wants when he's in this fantasy world. He can just basically wish things into existence. Um, he's like, oh, I want to be brave, so I need to have something to fight against. I want to be, you know what I mean? Like he he just like starts inventing problems for himself because he gets bored. Um, and he is this like kid with God powers, essentially, and he's extremely powerful. And when you have a character who is like literally a godlike character able to just like bend reality to their whim, that is inherently a difficult character to write in a way that is going to be super interesting, I think. Um, and because of that, I think especially for an extended period of time, I think like it was this. a mistake to spend so long in this state. This is the part of the book that should have been truncated. Um, I think if, if you know, for what it's worth, I believe the second half of the book um, could still be just as powerful with some significant whittling down. Um, because a lot of the adventures he goes on, some of them are cool and have certain sort of moral moments that are interesting. But other ones, I don't know, they just don't feel like they really have a place and it just felt like padding or like he's telling himself the story. Now, I'm not saying I would necessarily change it like, cause I like that this is a thing that exists in time. And I think it's a cool piece of art we can look at now. So I'm not trying to say we should change this book or anything. I'm just saying for people going forward who are maybe are trying to write stories of their own, um, it's something to watch out for is that you can, if you're dealing with a character like this in this moment of just supreme power, um, it's difficult to sustain that for half a book. A, a, a long it reminds book. me of like, like Neo in the Matrix when he like you know become be, when he like becomes one with the Matrix yeah. whatever it is when he like is all powerful yeah it's he's like not really as interesting tough. in the later movies right right yeah he's and that not. can that can happen yeah um it is very much like that in the sense that he has this power over the Matrix yeah I wonder if the Wachowskis would would you know say that there's any sort of inspiration yep. there very interesting I wonder if they're singing the theme song while they were writing <laughs> this while they were working on the script yeah um one thing that I do really like also is how the nature of past and memory is so important going forward. And throughout the book, he sort of learns that as with every memory he loses, he loses a piece of himself. And as the, the, the more of himself he loses, the more he's unable to go forward. And like his wishes are all powerful in this world. Yet the less he remembers, and the more he uses his power, he forgets. The less he remembers, the less um, use there is for his wishes, the less that he can like do right with them because he doesn't understand what the benefit is anymore. And you take that and you also take the, the sort of the fictional beings leaping into the nothing and turning themselves into lies um, to enter our world. And, and there's just a lot being said about the nature of stories and the nature of our interaction with them and what we can learn from them and how we should sort of approach them. Think about in the growing up with Nazism and how, I mean, I'm sure propaganda and lies were a constant thing that he saw everywhere in fictions that people were inventing and other people were believing um, and it were, were deadly and so I think when he's looking at like the, the power of stories, he's recognizing that there is this great power of good, but then there's also this danger. And it was interesting that the idea of the, of the lies is like the stories themselves choosing to come out with some sort of agenda turns them into lies, whereas there was like a more holistic way of doing it where like they're they're welcomed out by the by the human. I don't know. There's like... A, it's very it's very surreal uh it, it's like all this like stuff that's very meta and like metaphorical and turning it literal um which is very yeah. fascinating and i think as a kid i wouldn't it would have also gone over my head you know i'd just be like uh okay <laughs> yeah this is a children's book you know like all that's all that being said you know it's pretty wild um but there's a lot there to sink your teeth into as far as just like meta textual uh, philosophical stuff which is cool for a children's book um I, I I thought it was interesting how Atreyu is brought back and all of a sudden be, actually becomes kind of an important character again in the second half of the book after sort of being sidelined for a while. And he ends up being sort of the moral um, compass for Bastion, who keeps trying to bring him back. 
Um, and I, I don't know. I like that. Like uh, the, the, the protagonist of the story who is himself fictional um, has the power to remind us of ourselves Maybe it's being said like has yeah. if we if we can see what good was in that protagonist from the beginning, maybe we can like find our way back to ourselves through it. I don't know. I feel like they were trying to say something there. Yeah. Well, I like the idea too that like he's at this point where he can create anything, and yet the creations are lending something to him that he couldn't find himself. If that makes sense. So that's kind of in keeping with what we've been saying about story all along. Yeah. Is like even if you. You know, even if you feel that you're in control of everything, you might get a perspective shift from from some other work or something that that's a creation that's not in the real world because it's not in the real world because you're willing to engage with it in a different way than than you would otherwise. Yeah, I, I have one quote here that I think is is interesting, and it's talking about that lies thing we were talking about, and this is something that um, I think I think Gamork might say this. Not 100 percent sure. But, quote, when it comes to controlling human beings, there is no better instrument than lies. Because, you see, humans live by beliefs, and beliefs can be manipulated. The power to manipulate beliefs is the only thing that counts. Uh, and talk about a, a powerful quote for today and what we see going on in this country. Uh, the power yeah. of a narrative to manipulate people through lies um misinformation yeah i mean that is i mean that is that that power that is being talked about the manipulation of lies and how it can control humans and control their beliefs that has been amplified by the internet and you know uh everything we've been seeing so i think you know it's very interesting to have this (laughs) again in a children's book it kind of blows my mind and it's kind of in keeping with what we were saying also that it kind it becomes a different book it really is it would it would definitely be like i feel like if this was split into the idea of a sequel that was darker that maybe not even darker but but had more going on than the initial story in my opinion it kind of it just really like is in keeping with like the next step of the story yeah. and it feels like it, it just well, feels different it's a so. whole different arc for bastion right like this right. bastion in the first half of the book is a, is about he is the the hero of the story he learns that he is the one who can come in here and give the child like empress a name and save her and he can save this fantasy world and he can be the hero of the story that's his arc like believing in himself finding that the second half of the book is completely different he has now got god powers and it gets to his head and he starts like forgetting who he was and he forgets his life and he wants to just like be immersed in the fantasy world and and forget about the real world and he starts turning on his friends and becoming paranoid and uh, he basically almost killed Atreyu. Yeah, he almost kills kill Atreyu. Like I, I was thinking about how he's he's kind of being corrupted by this power, and um, he there is this character who's to me kind of a worm tongue type character. This this who yeah. comes in is like, oh, I'll be your slave. Like I'll do anything you wish, and then starts whispering to him about how, oh, you know, the Atreyu is going to try and take the amulet from you, and you know, I just kept thinking worm tongue and like Gollum a little bit. I don't know. I just there were some similarities to Lord of the Rings that kept popping up um yeah it, it not not a lot but just here or there um and i don't know just the corrupting power the corrupting influence of power i guess is what i'm trying to say um it felt akin to the one ring to me yeah no i definitely see that he encounters these ships at one point that are driven by like pilots who have like paired minds with other pilots to control these ships and i was like is this what inspired specific rim like did you think of that like yeah. <laughs> the drift thing like it was so similar. Like, I don't, there's just so many amazing little things. And I'm like, I wonder if, you know, somebody grabbed that and was like, ooh, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, ultimately, that's that's what we can see with the author, too, is like writing and being like, I have a great idea for another little segment. So many cool little ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have these hollow iron arm suits of armor. And I was thinking about Full Metal Alchemist and like how he was very popular in Japan. And the, 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 I don't know. There's just like. I don't know where the influence goes and where it doesn't, but I could see it potentially being far reaching, you know? Definitely. Yeah. Um, and uh, there, there was one line and I don't have it exactly written down, but it was about how these, these humans who have forgotten themselves, um, they forget their dreams 
and their dreams become these like pictures that get into the ground and he, he meets this like miner who mines out these pictures but he says something about how Fantastica exists on a foundation of forgotten dreams or a layer of forgotten dreams. I forget exactly what the line is, but that's so fascinating to me, right? Like the fantasy world, which is itself sort of a metaphor for our imaginations and our ability to live in, in the fantasy and to imagine existing on a foundation of forgotten dreams. What does that mean? <laughs> as a creative like so many times i'll wake up and i'll have some like really interesting dream and i'll be like I'll, sometimes i'll write it down and I, I i should do it more but sometimes i'm like that was a really weird thing like could i do something with that creatively i don't know i'll have to think about it a little bit more i'll have to like i'll have to work it around a little bit i gotta go brush my teeth get up and oh it's gone yep it's and gone, yeah. and just like I, I think he's saying something about the nature of the the overlap between imagination and dreams and and how we all for, like forgetting dreams is a very common thing right like they're very hard to remember because they're so surreal and bizarre like you often forget them so the idea of like your your imagination existing on this bed of forgotten dreams i, I just think that's cool like they're they're there yeah. providing some sort of foundation even though you don't remember them anymore yeah that's neat it really is i mean it's like think about how often we're dreaming and how things in your life don't need to take very long to really sink their hooks into you. Like if you're reading something or whatever it is, if we're dreaming so much and like how much it, it like our subconscious could potentially be forming how we, how we see the world shape, how we see the world and think yeah. um, in some like weird subliminal inside our own head way. So the joy of being able to love is ultimately the, the the final wish that he's fine because he 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 wishes for like wisdom he wishes for bravery he wishes for strength and all of these things get him a certain power but it's the ability to love that is the thing that will ultimately allow him to be able to leave and go back to the real world um and i think that's a that's a kind of a beautiful lesson right like if if, if you can take away from a book a lesson about the ability to the capacity for empathy and therefore the capacity capacity to love other people um i think they've done studies that show that readers tend to demonstrate higher levels of empathy and i think that that um is what is what um Anda is, is touching in on here that the idea that like it will teach you how to put yourself in someone else's shoes and that will lead to someone who is more capable of love and i, I think that holds true absolutely yeah totally agree with that yeah so very cool you know and like there's so much that we we barely touched on because there's a lot that happens in here um but i love that this book invites us in and in, in a meta way it invites us to become a part of it and it, it, it tells us you know uh it even ends i think very uh, uh, very near the end at least whatever we get the line every real story is a never-ending story and i like that right because that's true like our lives our lives are never-ending stories in a sense and that i mean they don't they don't they're much like this book and that they don't follow a plot structure <laughs> things just happen for no reason it doesn't go anywhere like if you were to lay out the plot of your life like usually it's like that makes no sense. Like, you know, that, that couldn't ever be a movie. You have to take that and form it into a structure if you're ever going to do a biopic or something because it doesn't. Real lives are, they're messy and they don't make sense and they don't have narrative flows to them. Yeah, my pacing is awesome over here. I don't know about you, but like <laughs> everything's very, very airtight. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I don't know, man. I'm still waiting for, for the turn, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, a fun book uh if you've made it this far and you haven't read it yet I, you know hopefully this this gives you a taste for it at least and and you know if, if you're interested in it I, I recommend giving it a giving it a try it's got enough like deep stuff going on that's cool and just know you know you might have to sort of uh trudge your way through some some, some swamps of sar of sadness <laughs> that exist in yeah. here uh some some slow parts um yeah ultimately i think it was a really rewarding read um i enjoyed i enjoyed like 75 percent of it i'll say <laughs> yeah. like like thoroughly uh whereas some of it felt like it and you know it might just be that it's a little dated or it might be just like for a different age group and that's just part of it 
So, you know, very subjective thing, I would say. Yeah. But ultimately, like, I, uh, the big ideas here, and ultimately what we see in this iconic movie are, it's pretty much adapted straight out of this. And, and while there's changes, it's not changes in, in the way that changing the narrative all that much. It's more, honestly, deletion. So, yeah. Maybe some of the nothingness coming and just like cutting out chunks of the of the uh, story was what was happening and, and that's why that's why he couldn't the author could well uh, and clearly he thought it was very important to have this inverse take place within the same book otherwise he you right. know maybe would have separated it out um there's a debate to be had about how important that is and we'll, we can have it next week when we touch on the film if you enjoyed our coverage of this book uh please let us know in the form of a rating and review on whatever app you listen to if you're on youtube give our video a like Make sure to subscribe on whatever platform you're on. That'll help our numbers. Um, and then maybe tell somebody if you liked this, you know? If you know anybody who's a never-ending story fan, let them know about this coverage. That'd be awesome. Yeah, we're on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all of those adding to film. Um, you know, you can let a friend know about that as well. <laughs> and uh, I would help share, you know, spread the word and share, share our podcast. And support us on Patreon if you would like. We have bonus content on there of all different kinds. And I think we are going to be doing another video piece uh, where we're going to do a tier ranking of our third season's adaptations. So look forward to that. If you want to get that, you know, hot off the presses, go to our Patreon, sign up, and you can watch that one uh, in the next week or two. Thank you to Ross Bugden for the use of our intro and outro music. All right, man. I, the only thing left to do is to go to this childhood classic, this this uh, bizarre, surreal movie that got made in the 80s. Um, I'm definitely yes. looking forward to that. Um, but that is another story and shall be told at another time. And until next time, keep adapting. <laughs>